Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Laurie Norton Moffitt, director of the Norman Rockwell Museum. And it's my pleasure to welcome you here this evening. And I thank you for coming on this spring-like winter day. Uh, I wonder how long our thaw will last, but it's nice to have it for a short while. This is the second of our Four Freedoms Forums, a town hall meeting at the Norman Rockwell Museum, which are designed as free monthly gatherings to come together in conversation about topics of immense importance to our community, as well as to our nation. The idea for the Four Freedoms Forum was born amidst the strident rhetoric of last year's political campaign and is rooted in the democratic principles that are eloquently expressed in Norman Rockwell's Four Freedoms paintings. As thoughtful positions about topics important to our nation, such as health care, immigration, poverty, energy, the economy, jobs, and education, became reduced to sound bites uh, during the campaign, party labels, phrases like the Tea Party and Obamacare, conservative and liberal, became code phrases to stand in and substitute for thoughtful discourse about the most pressing topics of the day. And civility, sadly, became a quaint, archaic concept, and it became increasingly difficult to learn what the real issues were behind the uh, strident rhetoric. The Four Freedoms Forums are open to everyone. This is a non-voting meeting. I love town hall meetings. Uh, but tonight we're here to talk, not to vote, or not to have outcomes. Uh, the conversations don't aim to result in decisions or acts or uh, law, winners or losers. Instead, the goal is to engage in public respectful dialogue and to learn and express a variety of viewpoints about complex topics. We hope these meetings will inform us and inspire ongoing civic action on these topics in the larger community. We hope, too, that the forum will serve as a model for civil discourse, inspired by the painting hanging behind me in the Four Freedoms Gallery, Freedom of Speech, which depicts a gentleman standing to speak at a town meeting, surrounded by respectful listeners who may or may not agree with the speaker, but who are turned to face him and listen respectfully to what he has to say. Dialogue and open inquiry emphasize listening, honesty, and open-mindedness. And in order to keep our conversation from moving toward an adversarial debate or non-personal discussion, we request that the following guidelines for civil dialogue be observed. Uh, we are going to be inviting you to all come up and speak this evening. So we ask you to speak in a cordial and considerate manner and present personal views in a way that invites others to hear without prompting <coughs> defensive opposition. Please try not to use the forum to promote your own business or program. Bring forward principles that can be applied in broad areas. Listen actively, express your thoughts, and seek opinions freely. And please avoid interrupting others when they are speaking and refrain from dominating the conversation. Please confront misperceptions without accusation or judgment. Ask open-ended questions to prompt meaningful exchange. And when there is disagreement, and we hope there will be, please keep talking to establish plentiful areas of common ground. Please be open to new ways of thinking and feeling, which will inspire true engagement with other participants' viewpoints. And please respect confidentiality by refraining from using other people's names or from sharing others' personal experiences. Try to avoid advocacy the act of pleading or arguing strongly in favor of a certain cause or idea or policy. Uh, we're trying to avoid debate. We don't want to polarize an issue into one point of view or another. And negotiation, which is a discussion intended to produce an agreement. We're aiming for open-endedness here. And do please promote reciprocity, the act of engagement with disparate views, rather than exclusively defending one's own view uh, active listening involving paraphrasing to clarify other statements, which is conducive to understanding them, and promote a search for common ground, establishing areas of agreement as a counter for polarization. I'll be serving as the moderator tonight, and in my role, the, I and the museum will remain neutral about a topic. Uh, we won't be expressing a point of view, but I certainly encourage you to express both facts related to the issue and to offer your own personal opinions. 
In fact, we'll consider this forum a success if there are a wide range of opinions expressed that are conveyed with passion, but without rancor, to which we all listen and perhaps open our minds and hearts to a broader perspective. We believe that our community is hungry for intellectual stimulation and conversation. To select the topics for the meetings, we formed a citizens council comprised of a, group, a diverse group of community leaders and citizens to select the topics and to help generate an audience. And I would like to thank those citizens for their volunteer time, as well as thank the experts on our forum this evening who are also here as volunteers from our community, people who have graciously agreed to assist in framing the issues with facts and their own expert opinions. So the topic selected tonight by the Citizens Council is focused on food, farms, and families. Henry David Thoreau once wrote, I am more and more convinced that with reference to any public question, it is more important to know what the country thinks of it than what the city thinks. The city does not think much. On any moral question, I would rather have the opinion of Boxborough than of Boston and New York put together. When the former speaks, I feel as if somebody had spoken, as if humanity was yet, and a reasonable being had asserted its rights, as if some unprejudiced men across the country's hills had at length turned their attention to the subject, and by a few sensible words, redeemed the reputation of the race. When in some obscure country town, the farmers come together to a special town meeting, to express their opinion on some subject which is vexing the land, that, I think, is the true Congress and the most respectable one that has ever assembled in the United States. Well, we have some great farmers here tonight, and we'll be hearing from them. We'll also be hearing from a chef, a farmer's cooperative, and a food pantry. Sustainable agriculture, food security, locally sourced food, hunger, poverty, nutrition, health, and wellness, obesity, type 2 diabetes, and the runaway cost of health care, the sources of our food, land use, and agriculture policy, and food affordability. Daily, we see headlines in the national and local news on these topics. 12% of the citizens in Berkshire County fall below the federal poverty level. How does healthy eating fit into this picture? Last year, I viewed the documentary King Corn and learned that for many Americans, their bodies are made of 80% corn. How can that be, two students from Yale wondered. And they set out on an odyssey to see where corn is grown and to try their hand at growing corn in the farm belt. A year later, they had learned about federal agriculture policy, the thin margin of survival of farmers, genetically engineered corn, the relationship of the petrochemical industry to farming, corn raised for ethanol, corn-fed beef, high fructose corn syrup, the corn-based nutrition of fast food, the explosion of diabetes and obesity in our nation's children due to poor nutrition, and much more. In 1940, food purchases accounted for approximately 40% of the family budget. Today, thanks to federal agriculture policy, it is about 10% making food affordable for more people. This is a good thing, right? Or is it when we learn that the population living in poverty has the worst health statistics and poorest nutrition, thanks to inexpensive but nutrition-empty food? Fast food nation, the omnivore's dilemma, in defense of food, authors like Michael Pollan and Barbara Kingsolver, among many others, have been writing about food, farming, and sustainability, raising public awareness of this essential need for human life. Tonight, I am indebted to Michael Pollan, a prolific author about the food movement who wrote last year for the New York Review of Books about the emerging and merging food movement. Here's an excerpt from his cogent summary. Cheap food has become an indispensable pillar of the modern economy, but it is no longer an invisible or uncontested one. One of the most interesting social movements to emerge in the last few years is the food movement, or perhaps I should say movements, since it is unified as yet by little more than the recognition that industrial food production is in need of reform because its social, environmental, public health, animal welfare, and gastronomic costs are too high. 
as that list suggests, the critics are coming at the issue from a great many different directions, where many social movements tend to splinter as time goes on, breaking into various factions representing divergent concerns or tactics, the food movement starts out splintered. Among the many threads of advocacy that can be lumped together under this rubric, we can include school lunch reform, the campaign for animal rights and welfare, the campaign against genetically engineered and modified crops, the rise of organic and locally produced food, efforts to combat obesity and type 2 diabetes, food sovereignty, the, which is the principle that nations should be allowed to decide their agriculture policies rather than submit to free trade regimes, the farm bill reform, food safety regulation, farmland preservation, students organizing around food issues on campus, efforts to promote urban agriculture and ensure that communities have access to healthy food, initiatives to create gardens and cooking <coughs> classes in schools, farm worker rights, nutrition labeling, feedlot pollution, and the various efforts to regulate food ingredients and marketing, especially to kids. Phew, how do we weave all that together? It is a big, lumpy tent, says Michael Pollan, and sometimes the various factions behind, beneath it work at cross purposes. For example, activists working to strengthen federal food safety regulations have recently run afoul of local food advocates who fear that the burden of new regulation will cripple the current revival of small farm agriculture. Joel Salatin, the Virginia meat producer and writer who has become a hero to the food movement, fulminates against food safety regulation on libertarian grounds in his, everything I want to do is illegal, war stories on the local <coughs> food front. On the other hand, hunger activists like Joel Berg and All You Can Eat, How Hungry Is America, criticize supporters of sustainable agriculture, in essence, producing food in ways that do not harm the environment for advocating reforms that threaten to raise the cost of food to the poor. Animal rights advocates occasionally pick fights with sustainable meat producers, such as Joel Salatin, as Jonathan Saffer Foer does in his recent vegetarian polemic, Eating Animals. But there are indications that these various voices may be coming together in something that looks more and more like a coherent movement. And I think we have the seeds of that right here in Berkshire County. Many in the animal welfare movement from PETA to Peter Singer have come to see that a smaller scale, more humane animal agriculture is a goal worth fighting for and surely more attainable than the abolition of meat eating. Stung by charges of elitism, activists for sustainable farming are starting to take seriously the problem of hunger and poverty. They're promoting schemes and policies to make fresh local food more accessible to the poor through programs that give vouchers redeemable at farmers markets to participants in the special supplemental nutrition program for women's infants and children, or known as WIC, and food stamp recipients. Yet a few underlying tensions remain. The hunger lobby has traditionally supported farm subsidies in exchange for the farm lobby's support of nutrition programs, a marriage of convenience dating to the 1960s that vastly complicates reform of the farm bill, a top priority for the food movement. I remember Peter Burley talking about the importance of reform of the farm bill and agriculture policy. Here in the Berkshires, we have lost 20% of our farmland to real estate development during the past two decades. Yet our locally grown farm movement is robust, has organized, educated, and worked to create a network of farm to table systems that have encouraged local farmers markets, restaurateurs, and supermarkets to support local farmers. Plus they grow nutritious food available in abundance without needing to be flown or shipped across the country or around the world and we'll hear tonight how they're reaching out to connect with people that fall below the poverty level. So how does society shape public policy when balancing competing values? Can the Berkshires shape policy that knits food affordability and sustainability on a local level? Our experts tonight will touch on these topics and more. After their introductions, we'll turn the conversation over to you for your comments and questions. And now, thank you for bearing with Michael Pollan's uh, long, but I think very cogent summary. Let me introduce tonight's speakers. After a brief five-minute introduction to the topic by each, 
panelists, we'll turn the meeting to you and you'll be the focus and subject of our conversation. And I just ask, when you have a comment or opinion, would you please step to the microphones, which we'll be bringing into each end of the room, uh, and speak right into it, because we are recording this program. And state your name and the town you live in, please. And if you could keep your comments to two minutes or less, uh, you'll have a chance to come back up as we keep um, making room for more speakers. Our experts tonight are Andrew Morehouse, Executive Director of the Food Bank of Western Massachusetts, a position he has held since 2005. As Executive Director, Andrew is responsible for overseeing the management of the organization, building partnerships with individuals, organizations, businesses, and government entities at all levels, carrying out public education and working with the Board of Directors to advance the mission of the Food Bank. He's held many positions in the community, uh, Community Development Corporation in Holyoke and uh, was director of the Casa del Pueblo in Washington, D.C. He serves on the Board of Partners for a Healthier Community and Community Action in Franklin, Hampshire, and North Quabbin regions, and is a member of the Leadership Council of the Western Massachusetts Regional Coordinating Network. Laura Meister is the farmer owner of Farm Girl Farm in Great Barrington and just completed her sixth year of vegetable production. She distributes her crops locally to several farm-to-table oriented restaurants in the Berkshires, as well as right at the farm where community members who buy a share of her crops can pick up their vegetables weekly. Laura specializes in heirloom and specialty varieties of vegetables with a focus on heirloom tomatoes, and she and her crew tend the four-acre farm almost entirely by hand so that the final product reflects a high level of attention to detail. Laura came to farming from the film and photography world, spending two years as a curatorial assistant at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, and finds farming to be a logical outgrowth of her visual training. She believes that the rigors and aesthetic experiences of film and vegetable production have a lot in common. Uh, in addition to running the farm, Laura sits on the board of Berkshire Grown, and she is a member of the newly formed Great Barrington Agricultural Commission. Barbara Zoitlin is the executive director of Berkshire Grown. A graduate of the University of California at Santa Cruz, she subsequently earned a master's de degree in clinical psychology. From November 1999 to 2002, she was development associate at the Orion Society in Great Barrington. A native of California, she moved to the Berkshires in 1995 and has been a member of Berkshire Grown since 2006. She's also a co-founder of Share the Bounty, an organization that raises funds to purchase shares in local farms that are donated to food pantries. Uh, she'll tell us about the programs of Berkshire Ground, Grown, so I won't go into that. Brian Alberg is executive chef and director of food and beverage for the Red Lion Inn, who promotes a sustainable menu. He graduated from the Culinary Institute of America in Hyde Park and took positions in a number of high-profile kitchens in the Berkshires, including head chef at the 1780 Agramont Inn. He left the area for a while to be an executive chef and has made numerous appearances at the James Beard House, including one earlier this month. Uh, Brian offers specials at both dinner and lunch, which allow him to express his creativity with food and his close relationships with farmers and producer, producers inspire him as he works to bring locally grown food into the menu at the Red Lion Inn, and he's a farmer himself. And our fifth speaker is <clears throat> Lila Burley, a farmer who operates one of the largest sheep farms in Massachusetts on her farms located in Alford, Great Barrington, Egremont, and Stockbridge. Lila is not afraid of getting her hands dirty. You'll often find her behind the wheel of her tractor, mowing a field or tending her sheep. And she has a deep, abiding reverence for the environment. That reverence was made obvious with the protection of Sky Farm with a conservation restriction. She's devoted herself to causes that help others in the Berkshires as well as nationwide. And uh, she has served on many boards in the area, including uh, being the founding emeritus president of the Norman Rockwell Museum. She is a voice for the local farmer, and a committed activist to the open space movement, and she's a lifelong resident of Berkshire County. So now I would ask uh, Andrew Westmoreland to uh, please come to one of the microphones and we'll start the program. Thank you very much. 
Um, that's uh, Andrew Morehouse, not related to the Westmorelands, whoever they are. Anyway, uh, very impressive audience. Uh, thanks for coming tonight and inviting me. I really appreciate it. My apologies if I'm, my back is to you. And I will try to be very brief because I know three minutes can go very, very fast. Um, so what I'd like to start off by saying is that I'm very passionate about uh, the work that I do and the issue that I work on uh, because I believe in one of the core values of the Food Bank of Western Massachusetts, which is uh, that we believe that everyone has and should have uh, access to nutritious and affordable food regardless of uh, economic, constra uh, economic inequalities and social constraints. Uh, and uh, that, that is important because, uh, you know, a little known secret that hopefully isn't a surprise to anyone, that people who are on a line in front of a pantry or a meal site would rather not be. Uh, they would much prefer to have a job earning a, a fair wage so that they can uh, support themselves and their families uh, and go to a grocery store or a farmer's market or a community garden or a, a, have a share at a CSA to get the healthy food they need to support themselves. You know, simply, they would like uh, a seat at the table, uh, the dinner table, if, if not the decision-making table. Uh, so what I'd like to do is leave you with kind of two broad concepts that we work with a lot uh, and then a moment uh, to talk about what the role of the food bank is and then I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Uh, the first uh, um, concept uh, that we use a lot in, in our work is called uh, food insecurity. It, uh, there's lots to talk about it, but it's uh, analogous to, uh, although not the same, as the poverty rate. Uh, in fact, in uh, Berkshire County, there are uh, 16,000 people who are quote unquote food insecure of the roughly 130,000 people. That, so that is about uh, uh, 12, almost 13% of the population, but they're not always poor. Uh, and the way we uh, like to describe uh, food insecurity is uh, by the inverse. What, what is the opposite? What, is, what does it mean to be food secure? Uh, and the definition more or less goes like this. It's, it's, a, it's a condition when a, a household uh, has uh, access to uh, affordable and nutritious food at all times to lead a, a healthy and active life. So the way to think about it is uh, in, the, in, in a continuum. If at one end you have the extreme of starvation, which fortunately we don't see, experience or see in, in the United States, but clearly it, it, uh, it, per, it permeates uh, many parts of this world, uh, and at the other extreme you have this state of food security. And anywhere in between you have uh, the levels of uh, food insecurity at, the, uh, uh, at one end uh, leading up to food security at the other end. Uh, and so uh, we, the food bank, uh, uh, work uh, to uh, address the needs of, of food insecure families who are experiencing hunger, uh, very close to, but not the same as starvation, uh, all the way to people who experience malnutrition uh, because they're not eating the right kinds of foods uh, uh, that are healthy and, and, and lead to a, a, a nutritious balanced meal. And a clear example of that is the uh, epidemic levels of obesity that we see in this country that are clearly correlated uh, with access to healthy food and in turn uh, there are correlations to uh, income levels. But uh, people at all income levels and in all colors uh, 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 and all ethnicities uh, uh, experience obesity. So that is, is uh, one concept that I'd like to leave you with. The second is uh, uh, the hardship gap. And, and the way to illustrate why that is so important is that uh, food insecurity is an issue that people face whether they are uh, unemployed or employed and still not able to meet their food needs. And the way to de describe it is as such, uh, in Western Massachusetts, a, a family of four uh, with two children uh, need to earn approximately fifty-four, fifty-six thousand dollars to support themselves and sustain their family. And yet, if you look at uh, a family with two working adults and, and two kids, uh, the, the parents, the, the adults uh, earning minimum wage, if they're fortunate to have full uh, employment, uh, working 40 hours a week, will only earn about thirty-three thousand dollars. And yet we, as I just mentioned, 
uh, that family needs approximately $54,000 to sustain its bare uh, necessities. So the hardship gap is that difference between what, it, uh, what one needs to earn to sustain themselves and what they might be able to earn even if they're gainfully employed, uh, two parents working full time. So I'd like to leave you with that so when you hear uh, uh, that there are people who are underemployed, unemployed, with disabilities, can't work, uh, there's, there's no question to be asked. Uh, uh, th these are people that are clearly experiencing hardship, but even the hardworking people can't make ends meet uh, in, this, uh, in this economy, in this society. So the role of the food bank is, multi is, is broad, but our core strategy is to serve as the region's uh, uh, distributor of emergency food. We have a warehouse in Hatfield, Massachusetts, we receive food from lots of different places, including local farms and local businesses and many other places. Uh, and we store that food in our warehouse and then we distribute it through a vast network of local pantries, meal sites, shelters, and other social service programs. In Berkshire County, there are over 80 of them from uh, the Vermont border to the Connecticut border. And the food gets distributed to those local programs the staff and volunteers of those programs know people in their communities who are having a hard time, struggling to get by, and those families and individuals know that they can go to these pantries and meal sites uh, for uh, healthy, nutritious food uh, to sustain themselves uh, for another day until they can get back up on their feet and overcome a, a crisis that they may be facing. In addition to that, we provide, uh, we work with, with groups uh, to look at longer term solutions, whether it be through local policy all the way up to federal pol policy or connections to uh, other uh, solutions to, to hunger that I, I know my colleague will, will want to talk about a little bit later. So I'll leave you with those things to think about and um, look forward to hearing the next speaker. Thank you, Andrew. Our next speaker is uh, Barbara Zoitlin from Berkshire Grown. As I was listening to Andrew talk about food insecurity and the hardship gap, and earlier listening to all the problems of obesity, diabetes, I thought back to what I used to do a few decades ago, which was try to stop the world from destroying itself with nuclear weapons. I was an activist at that time trying to prevent nuclear war at a time when uh, people in our government thought that the solution might be if we got hit by an atomic bomb, we would just throw dirt on ourselves. And it, led, it was called With Enough Shovels, was one of the people in Ronald Reagan's cabinet. And he truly believed this. And it, it, how many remember, does anyone remember, remember this moment? Um, and so for me, the connection is these are very difficult times we live in. More people are hungry. So I think about that time when I thought we were gonna lose the whole world. And I, I try to remember how did we keep going when we thought we were gonna lose the whole world to nuclear destruction. We do it together. We collaborate. We inspire each other. What Berkshire Grown does and what brought me to Berkshire Grown was it offers a vision of a different world. Sometimes when you're organizing people or educating, you use fear. It's, it's one strategy. What I love about Berkshire Grown is that we try to use delight, delicious food, camaraderie, dirt from the soil, vegetables we grew ourselves 
to come together. It's a positive image. We have wonderful ways of networking people. We work with the food bank on this fabulous idea, Share the Bounty. It's a way to support local farmers, at the same time help feed some of our hungry neighbors. We, help, we ask people to give us money so we can buy shares in local farms, and then we distribute the food through our partners at food pantries. It's, it's an exciting idea, it's a win-win. So, I'll, I'm here to answer questions later about any of our wonderful farm-to-table programs, our fabulous harvest suppers, all kinds of wonderful strategies that all of us are coming up with to address the multitude of problems. But what I want it to sort of spark in everyone is your imagination for what is possible. We're on this earth so briefly. What we can do in making our connections with each other stronger is what really matters. And it's tough. And when it's really getting you down and you see and we hear all these horrible things that are going on, it really helps to reach out. And if you can, grab a freshly grown vegetable and share it with a friend to remind yourself why, why we're here and what we can contribute to our community. And by the way, that helps strengthen the local economy. It helps protect our open space. It's, it's actually a wonderful strategy towards creating the world that we'd like to see. Thank you, Barbara.